What's going on, guys? I'm Tyler, and there is no perfect movie. And, um, well, there's no easy way of saying this other than the holidays are over. I have a canker so bad that every time I swallow, it makes my one ear hurt like hell. And on top of that, I'm waiting for the booster side effects to kick in. So what better time to count down my top 10 worst movies of 2021? A year that was for painfully obvious reasons, significantly better than the last in terms of movies and almost everything else, except for human intelligence, but that's another subject. But, um, nevertheless, these movies that I'm about to mention felt like a chore to sit through to the point where half of these I didn't even bother reviewing, especially because I was excited to check out every single one that I'm about to mention based on the potential that they had. They were, they could have been significantly better than what we got. And I think that, to me, makes a movie worse when it has potential to be great and then completely squanders it based on bad acting, writing direction, intentions, as you're about to find with my number one, among many other reasons. But before we get into that, I do like to list a few dishonorable mentions. Cruella for the first half was an above average Disney remake with great performances, an original style, and a killer soundtrack. But then every twist imaginable started to kick in where it absolved Cruella of any wrongdoing whatsoever and turned her from one of the most intimidating Disney villains of all time into a bland and generic anti-hero for no reason other than political correctness changing the past. I have absolutely no idea what they were thinking with on this one. Jungle Cruise had Dwayne Johnson and Emily Blunt having great chemistry, but that's really all it had. Jack Whitehall, who... I love is a terrific dark comic, never landed a laugh once for me. And look, I don't have a problem with a straight guy playing a gay guy. It is called acting after all. And to be honest, if the character was written in such a stereotypically flamboyant way, I can't really imagine a gay, a gay actor even wanting to play this part, let alone improving upon it. It is the writing that messes around with the performance, but at the same time, He's such a good improviser, let alone a good comic, so it's shocking and disappointing that he was this bad in this. Jesse Plemons as the villain, too underutilized. I don't get how some people even praise him as the strengths of it, seeing as how he's barely in it and barely has a relationship with the heroes. The action is filled to the brim with shaky cam and really crappy CGI, and in the words of Chris Stuckman, the girl power message is about as subtle as a sledgehammer to the face and is almost as mean-spirited as Black Christmas. It's actually shocking that they think audiences are that fucking stupid. We know that women are just as smart as men. We know they're equals. We've known that for fucking decades, guys. Stop acting like this is stop acting like the 50s were yesterday. Honestly. And uh, last but not least, The King's Man has one of Ray Fiennes' most sympathetic characters and some of the stylistic traits that we love about the franchise, but it doesn't have the emotional stakes or the characterization of the first two that, even with Golden Circle, were still enjoyable. Jaimin Unsu and Gemma Arterton are extremely underdeveloped. You never learn a single thing about them other than they're good. Some action sequences were fantastic, like the battle in the trenches, but then you have others that rely way too much on 360 degree tracking shots that made it that made it kind of dizzy as you were watching them. The villain went from being this cool Dr. Claw type of over the top villain and then the reveal was so anticlimactic. The World War 1 tie-ins were so confusing that it made absolutely zero sense and as you can tell, it was just a mess altogether. So waste of money watching all of those in theaters. And the worst part is, there are 10 movies that were harder to sit through than that, so here we go. Dear Evan Hansen has some nice sounding songs in terms of composition and the actors singing, even though the lyrics themselves sound more like reading lines from the script as opposed to self-contained songs that you could listen to even if you had never seen the play before. And it does have some okay performances from people like Danny Pino, Amy Adams, and Ben Platt. I honestly do not care in the slightest if he was too old for the part. And the reason I say that is because literally everyone in this movie 
is too old for their parts. I get that he has an awkward looking face, but still, he's not alone on this. But in any case, the way that this movie decides to approach the message by focusing more on the positive aspects of social media in treating mental illness without a single character in this movie who is actually a mental health expert, like a psychotherapist, a psychiatrist, even a mental health nurse, the fact that there are no characters like that in this movie is beyond insulting. And the weird thing is, Evan Hansen, a guy who lies his ass off for the sake of comforting other people and then for his own attention, is amazingly still the most sympathetic character in this entire movie because everyone else is either too busy pitying themselves for the shit that's happened to them, or they're just way too mean-spirited at the beginning for us to even give a shit. Julianne Moore especially, her character pissed me off so much, and this mostly has to do with the writing, but nevertheless, she is constantly leaving her depression and anxiety-prone son who is taking medication and injured himself in what was clearly a suicide but attempt, but nobody understood that, all by himself, all the fucking time, because... Single mom nurse, budget cuts, overworking, the most lazy writing you could possibly imagine. And the execution of that was so piss poor that I'm not kidding when I say this. I'd rather leave Evan Hansen all alone with Mr. and Mrs. Turner. At least they would actually spend time with their son and check in on them. Now, the reason this movie is so low on the list is because it actually did have some darker and more risky jokes than you would get for a family-friendly movie like this, and a few of them do pay off in some circumstances. Matilda Lawler and Ben Schwartz actually give in great work, they have nice chemistry, and they're able to balance out the comedic and dramatic moments, and most of the special effects revolving around Ulysses were pretty decent, but... This is still an extremely predictable premise that is filled with a lot of clumsy and forced slapstick gags. There are so many unlikable and annoying side characters like Allison Hannigan as the mom who cannot take the slightest criticism of her work. It's really no reason that no one wants to spend time with her all that much, especially not even Danny Pudi, who isn't even in it all that much as the villain other than to get mauled by a CGI cat and be a terrible shot with a tranquilizer gun and there's a, this ridiculous climax that did not need to happen because everything else within the story had already been resolved but they had to spend 30 minutes on a prison break in an animal shelter just to raise up the dramatic stakes you gotta love when they throw that in for no reason and as much as i give this movie full credit for trying to address what kids and adults go through in separation and divorce it was so poorly executed because the reason they d separated in the first place made absolutely zero sense, and it's resolved a lot quicker than it was actually explored. If kids were to watch this movie just to learn what happens when parents get divorced and what might happen to them, I swear to you, they're not going to learn a single thing. I feel bad putting this movie on my list since I personally reached out to the studio to review it in the first place because I wanted to check out something that was made from Can from Canada and was considerably low budget that could have used some extra support. And I can safely say that there were some redeeming qualities about it. For a low budget horror movie, it has some top notch seamless special effects that present this ominous atmosphere when it is a horror movie. Most of the acting is decent altogether, and I appreciate the themes that they were trying to tackle, like internalized racism or abusive religious power. It's just... There are so many side characters that get little to no depth whatsoever, including the girl who gets kidnapped in the first place and then all of a sudden is being viewed as this messiah type of prophet. And some of these themes don't get explored as often as they would like to because they feel like they have to set up as many characters as they possibly can through exposition monologues to each other over details that, since they're already friends and family, they should already know these things by now. Like, why would you wait until your son is 15 to say, hey, because I was matey, I was persecuted like this and that when I was your age? Like, why are you waiting until now to say that? There were so many subplots that were, that were poorly set up, come out of absolutely nowhere, and then in some circumstances get dropped in that very scene that they're introduced. 
I can't even remember how this movie ended other than the fact that it left a lot of plot points unresolved. And it was one of those few cases where leaving something up to interpretation was just not a good idea whatsoever. Eternals is not Marvel's worst movie by any means, but it is their most disappointing because there was so much potential for them to do something they either hadn't done in a long time or ever before. A Marvel movie that could have taken place entirely in the past like the first Avenger. Something that would have had more philosophical drama and complex characters than likable everyday people who spout out a lot of cheap lazy one-liners. And something that could have been as artistic as it was commercial, kind of like what Denis Villeneuve does. And you get glimpses of that in between a lot of unnatural, wooden performances, tons and tons of expository monologues from characters who were not given an equal amount of screen time, monologues about who they are as people, what their personality traits are like, how they feel towards humanity, what's happened in between the present day and the flashback since they obviously couldn't show everything because this was a two and a half hour introduction where you honestly should have made an entire movie about them in the past and then do a sequel in the present because it's not like they wouldn't have made enough money to not make a sequel. And on top of that, we can tell when it was the present day without popping up title cards saying present day. I mean, how fucking stupid do you honestly think we are? The action scenes were nothing we haven't seen before. Half the time you can't even see them since they take place in the dark. And in regards to the defense a lot of people made about how diverse the cast and crew are, here's my best way of criticizing that. If the writing, direction, cinematography, editing are all bad, and the actors in particular are doing a bad job, what does their diversity have to do with anything? How does that make it good? That's something I don't understand, and they can't even execute that properly. Marvel's first deaf hero, an entire hour goes by without her even in it. Not in the flashbacks, and not in the present day. So... Real bonehead job there. And Marvel's first gay hero, I said this in my review and I'm going to say it again, he has less complexity than gay background character tropes. Really think about that. Black Widow finally got her own solo movie. One that spends more time setting up a brand new Black Widow and exploring the backstories of characters who weren't in it enough anyways to make a good impression, or we're in it too long is pathetically annoying comic relief rather than the Black Widow we have grown to love and appreciate over the past 11 years and wanted a movie based entirely around her backstory. So, nice job there. This is a classic example of a movie that was made several years too late and it totally shows. One thing that all four Marvel movies this year had in common was that they were all family dramas about reconcealing the past and learning to make peace with people you either harmed or they have harmed you in order to earn a second chance. But whereas Shang-Chi and No Way Home explored those themes in greater detail by actually showing you what the characters have been through, Black Widow's way of exploring family dilemma, much like Eternals, is by having characters sit around in a circle explaining events that have happened in between the past and present, as opposed to actually expressing themselves, or at least letting us see what they've actually been through, through flashbacks, or through, again, an entire movie that could have taken place in the past. The first 20 minutes of Black Widow were the best part, because it felt more like a Homeland or Americans episode. It felt much more subtle and nuanced in regards to the dialogue, the characterization, a lot of foreshadowing as to who these characters were before and how well trained they were as spies. And all of these problems could have been fixed with amazing action sequences, because it's a Black Widow movie, you kind of expect that, but Kate Shortland as, a, as the director or Marvel interfering with her vision, I neither one would really surprise me all that much. They made the huge mistake of copying the Russo Brothers style of gritty, shaky cam and quick cut editing without understanding how those brothers used it as a style in the first place. All of the set pieces are just ripping off the Winter Soldier in regards to the location and utilization of it through the choreography. Taskmaster as a villain was a huge letdown. Someone who can mimic the fighting styles of other heroes and use it to their advantage. They couldn't even give enough time 
to actually have Taskmaster use those abilities and be badass. Karen Gillan, Lena Headey, Michelle Yeoh, Carla Gugino, Ralph Ineson, Paul Giamatti, all of them have proven themselves to be terrific actors. Hell, the director is famous for making Tarantino's favorite movie of 2013, which is why it's a damn shame that this is really just another generic action thriller about an assassin deciding to protect their last target from their bosses. It's filled with every unimaginative character trope you can possibly find, like the stoic assassin learning to be kinder towards other people, the child damsel who has to learn to take adults and life more responsibly, the mentor who left the protege all by themselves in order to protect them, and the, and the big boss who sits behind a desk, barks orders to their cool but underutilized henchmen, and never get to kick any ass themselves. Don't you hate that cliche the most? That's... It's the reason John Wick 2 is the worst in the franchise. Nobody in this movie is technically giving a bad performance, except for Angela Bassett. As per usual, she's so over the top it's not even funny, but you do get the sense that they're not really trying that hard either, except for when they're doing the action sequences. And if those sequences were fun, or at the very least had an original spin to them, this could have been a passable film, but for whatever reason, most of the fight choreography is just these ladies standing still, pointing a gun and shooting someone. And even when they do use weapons, there are too many cuts in between that uh, remove the physical or emotional impact of each hit. So even though you can see what's going on, the feeling that you're supposed to get is completely gone. There was another movie like this uh, in 2021 called The Protégé that had a lot of these cliches and was just as simple, if not more. But it made up for that by having fun action and performances that were miles above the material that they were given that they elevated it. Go watch The Protégé or Nobody instead. You'll be much more satisfied. M. Night Shyamalan and Ding Dong had one of the best premises of the year practically gift-wrapped in his hands, and he still managed to fuck it up. A group of people stranded on an island that rapidly ages them a year every 30 minutes is a fantastic concept. It lends itself to some claustrophobic mixes of psychological and body horror and inherently provides some thoughtful themes about what it really means to grow old. This feeling that time passes a lot quicker than it actually does to make us reflect on goals we either have or haven't done in life and whether or not we still can accomplish them before it's too late. The perceived stigma that comes with growing old to the point where people constantly refer themselves as being 50 to 60 years young instead of old, which <sighs> I never liked it when people do that. What we ended up getting was Shyamalan's most ambitious, but one of his sloppy and most terrible directing jobs. The cinematography is filled with a lot of poorly constructed long takes where the camera was out of focus and the actors were awkwardly positioned in the frame where there was no there was no symmetry there was no well for lack of a better term there was no composition another ensemble cast of great actors embarrassing themselves trying to make this horrific unrealistic dialogue full of unlikable and poorly fleshed out characters who spend more time guessing what's happening to themselves on the island as opposed to actually trying to escape sound natural. And with a few exceptions, most of them come across like malfunctioning robots. If anything, if the twist was that there was a robot watching over them on this island, that would have made more sense than the twist we got. Hell, this is one of those cases where there didn't even need to be a twist. Why is this island aging them? Was it supernatural or was it man-made? Was it put on this earth in the first place for a specific reason? Has anyone escaped? All of these ideas are so much more interesting to guess for ourselves, but as per usual, Shyamalan doesn't think we're smart enough to do that. And the twist he gives us is an interesting concept, but it was poorly executed. I bet you haven't even heard of this one, have you? Deliver Us From Evil is the most... It's a cheaper, more obvious ripoff of the Taken franchise than most of Liam Neeson's entire career, which is really saying something. 
it's just another example of a retired killer who sets out to rescue his daughter from human traffickers, all the while being chased by a vengeful and equally dangerous killer who, I don't know, his brother or something was killed by the main character, and even though he didn't like his brother, family bonds, it dictates him to go after him anyways. Gotta love when they put absolutely zero thought in the motivation and don't try to hide it. Hell, this entire movie doesn't even try to hide the fact that we've seen this story a billion times. The one thing that was actually a fresh and original addition to this formula was that the main character's only source of help was a trans woman prostitute who was his tour guide and only source of comfort. And she's risking a lot to help him since... She obviously has bigger issues to deal with, and those issues, when they are explored, make her the only likable or fleshed-out character. But outside of outside of her, I don't really even remember that much about this movie. It was an extremely forgettable action movie where even the fight sequences could not save it. I don't even really remember what happened in those fights other than there were two techniques that I can't stand about action, one that was brand new to me. As per usual, there was a lot of quick cut editing over characters just standing around, pointing a gun, and shooting. I love that people seriously think that we haven't gotten bored of this yet, but the new technique that I've never seen anyone do before and hope that I never see again is that every time there's a final blow, instead of kicking into slow motion like Zack Snyder, they actually speed up the footage to kind of make it look like there's more of an impact to it and kind of make it look cool, which... It didn't. It was actually cartoonish. I kind of prefer slow motion nowadays. It was ridiculous. For the longest time, I thought for sure that this was going to be number one on the list because for months on end, nothing could top how bad this was. I've never liked Zack Snyder as a filmmaker or as a person, and his fan base is one of the fucking worst in existence. Snyder cultists can go fuck themselves. Words cannot describe how much I hate these fucking twats. But I still wanted to give this a movie a chance. I mean, a heist movie that takes place during a zombie outbreak where some of the zombies actually have human intelligence and pose a legitimate threat to these soldiers. This movie had a ton going for it, and I'd be lying if I said that they didn't take advantage of the premise. But I'd also be lying if I said that they took every chance they could with it, because for a two and a half hour movie, they waste a lot more time on filler moments on this needless and complicated subplot about this one member of the crew kidnapping a zombie that was advanced and studying it for research, because Lord knows that's not going to backfire on you eventually. Like, dude, have you never watched Jurassic Park? I'll never understand why these villain cliches of capturing something for research only to kill it. I'm never going to understand why that stuff still exists whatsoever. But the thing that drove me most was how much time was spent on these insufferable mercenaries who all think that they're comedians and were listening to their god-awful, lame, unfunny jokes as opposed to the zombie attacks that we actually wanted to see. Everyone who complained about Zack Snyder being too brooding... Probably regret saying that right about now because the weeding cut was funnier than this. Mostly because the cast of Justice League can actually tell a joke without screaming it off the top of their lungs or repeating it over and over again until we at least fake laugh. Take Nataro reciting comic relief that was clearly meant for Crystalia. You can tell that their differing deadpan styles make a huge difference. Her jokes never landed once, and she was so unconvincing as a military soldier, let alone a helicopter pilot. Like, wearing sunglasses and a smoking a Cuban? That doesn't make you Top Gun. Theo Rossi was the most cartoonishly over-the-top predator I've ever seen in a movie. And as a Border Patrol guard, because... Yeah, even Zack Snyder thought that he was smart enough to talk about that. He was so blatantly obvious as the kind of rapey authority figure that you would see on CNN every day that he might as well have been named Rapey McDouchebag. That's how blatantly obvious it was. And Matthias, however the fuck you say his last name, I wanted to kick him in the nuts every time he told a joke, every time he screamed off the top of his lungs at the slightest threat of danger. 
there are big Bang Theory nerds with more dignity and realism than this guy. This guy is up to par with the coffee guy from Day After Tomorrow, and the fact that he got his own spinoff before this movie came out is insulting and ridiculous. Not even Dave Bautista giving his most committed performance that does save scenes, it can't save this entire movie. So anyways, guys, um, based on how popular my most recent review has been, some of you can probably already guess what my number one is. It was something that I was struggling whether or not to put it at number three just because the two that I listed before technically were lazy and derivative and the kind of movie that this one was attacking. But nevertheless, the movie that drove me insane the most of 2021 was... Now, the reason I put Matrix Resurrections at the top of the list was because it felt absolutely nothing like a Matrix film, even, even though it does come from Lena Wachowski. And what I realized was going to be a huge problem 20 minutes into the film was that there are entire lines of dialogue, entire side characters, and entire scenes that felt more like a Deadpool film than a Matrix film. It's one of those movies that claims to be a satire of the Hollywood system. And in case it wasn't already obvious, there's a conversation between Neo, who in this is a video game developer who made a trilogy of games called The Matrix and based it on himself and his dreams, is being told by his business partner that Warner Brothers is going to make a fourth one with or without them and they might as well join in in order to make a quick buck. Meanwhile, there's an entire montage of people going, people like sequels and reboots, they know these nostalgic aspects, but we need to bring something that is brand new and original. We need to revolutionize it again. And they're all saying, ah, it's not going to be as good before. When this new edition of Morpheus is constantly trying to recite Lawrence Fishburne's lines and going, you know what? That wasn't good. My timing was so off. Agent Smith looking at Neo as they're fighting, doing the exact same fighting moves over and over again, hitting the concrete pillar in slow motion on cue and going, like all times, when you agree, or looking at how bad Neo sucks at fighting and going, you're not the same man you used to be, are you, Mr. Anderson? This is one of those films that seriously thinks it's attacking sequels and reboots for relying too much on nostalgia and being lazy and predictable. Meanwhile, this is a sequel slash reboot that is so lazy and predictable and relies on the nostalgia of the original trilogy and is attacking us as the audience for wanting a new movie in the first place. Well, you know something, Lena Wachowski? It's not our fault that you forgot how to make good original movies in the first place. Jupiter Ascending was not a failure. It was not a crappy movie because it was an original concept. It failed because the acting was awful, the characters were boring, the dialogue was so unintentionally funny, the world building was not original whatsoever, it just ripped off other better sci-fi movies in case that scene that was an homage to Brazil and even had Terry Gilliam in it wasn't obvious enough. And the fact that you got $175 million to make Jupiter Ascending, and even though it bombed, they gave you $190 million to make this new Matrix movie, it's not like you couldn't have pitched an original concept of your own, assuming you have any more original concepts in the first place. Or hell, why couldn't you just pitch them, hey, People really wish that Sensei didn't get canceled after two years. Can we, um, can we make a movie? Can we make a third season? You know, things that people petitioned and actually wanted in the first place? As opposed to deliberately making a movie that insults your intelligence by providing exposition monologue after exposition monologue that fills in the gaps over what happened in between the third and fourth movie, along with some new philosophical themes about how people don't want anything new, they don't want control over their lives, they just want comfort, which is absolutely a true statement, but criticizing your audience like that with such little respect for them to discover things in the first place was not a good idea. It was not a good idea to deliberately have the actors who clearly don't want to be there giving half-assed performances. It was a bad idea to deliberately film the fight sequences in crappy shaky cam and quick cut editing that 
poorly shows the fact that the actors worked their asses off to perfect the wire work stunts. It was so disrespectful to us for wanting great action and to the actors who worked hard to accomplish this. Jessica Henwick gets a lot of praise as this main character. I'm not entirely sure why she... All I know is about her is that she has blue hair and she's named after Bugs Bunny because her name is Bugs. She has a bunny tattoo, a carrot shirt, and she says, What's up, Doc? once or twice. In case we seriously couldn't have guessed about that about her. Yaya Abdul-Mateen and Jonathan Groff, new actors in old roles, they were unbelievably miscast and were way too over the top, as I pointed out. Carrie Ann Moss and Keanu Reeves having more of a romantic connection than the original trilogy was one of the few things they had going for it, but Carrie Ann Moss is barely even in it, and she puts less effort into this performance than she did in Revolutions. <sighs> Point being, why would you waste nearly $200 million to intentionally make a crappy movie when you could have taken half of that money and make something that whether it was good or not would have been something we hadn't seen before. At least movies that actually satirize Hollywood formulas have something new to offer and are at least intentionally entertaining. So anyways, guys, those are my top 10 worst movies of 2021. Thank you so much for sticking with me for the entire video. Let me know in the comments below what are the worst movies you've seen all year. Be sure to stay tuned for my best of the year list. I'm going to wait till New Year's of 2022 to do my best of the year list because Macbeth doesn't come out in theaters where I live until then. And that's probably the one movie that I'm waiting on before making the list. I have high hopes that it'll be on there. So stay tuned for that. Be sure to let me know in the comments below what you thought of this list. Be sure to stay tuned for more reviews and be sure to like and subscribe. Take care.